good? You well? Awesome. Hey, it's pretty fascinating. When, when you study the book, uh, uh, when you're studying through the, the good book, <laughs> through the Bible, and you're looking at the various, uh, the book, the good book, uh, the prophets, um, you see that uh, the prophets um, uh, uh, bring forth the message of the coming uh, Messiah, um, and they have these little followings, but it's not necessarily uh, welcomed. And then all of a sudden you get into this new era where uh, God becomes flesh and begins to dwell among us, and we see um, the cousins. We see John the Baptist, and then we see Jesus, and they both have their ministries, and they did things a little bit different in that... Um, uh, they didn't travel by themselves. They welcomed disciples, okay? They welcomed uh, people to be close to them. And so we see a new breed of prophet, and it's not loner prophet, it's, it's community prophet. We see a new form of, 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 of personal, intimate, mystical relationship directly with the Father, and yet it's not so mystical and secretive that outsiders aren't welcome to come and to be a part of this thing. And so um, uh, John the Baptist was a radical new breed of evangelists on the earth, heralding and making way um, for Messiah, for Messiah, uh, for Yeshua. And so John the Baptist goes and he has his, his own disciples. And then it's interesting because Jesus begins his ministry, not in isolation, but Jesus begins his ministry by recruiting 12 ordinary dudes that would follow him and live with him for three years, at which point Jesus would die, okay, be buried, he'd be resurrected, uh, he would ascend okay um, uh, and and his and his followers got to see this happen his followers got got to watch Jesus go floating up in the air as a cloud came rolling in <laughs> Jesus opens the door to the cloud gets into the cloud and then takes off right they're all standing there all of a sudden the men in white linen show up and they're like how long are you guys gonna wait around here for and they're like until he comes back he said he would come back and they're like well yeah it's gonna be a little longer than you think you need to you know um, go along now. If it wasn't for the men in white linen, we'd still be there to this day waiting for Jesus to come back, drooling on ourselves. Uh, yeah? Now, we have these 12 disciples who get filled with the Holy Spirit, along with 120 in the upper room, okay? Um, and a great persecution comes, and it, and it scatters them uh, to all these various regions and nations, okay? And we see this scattering and this revival that just begins to go everywhere these fire starters go. These revivals break out, and everywhere these people, people go, everywhere these fire starters go, um, uh, there is revival and there's harvest, and people are being added to their number. It is radical. It is supernatural that Jesus changed. Jesus said, come and follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. And this won't be by your might nor by your power, but by the spirit of the Lord. And Jesus begins modeling spirit-filled, supernatural ministry. But what he doesn't do is he doesn't say, hey, look at what I can do. You'll never be able to do what I can do. I, I am a one of a kind. Buy my books. Do my e-course. You know, um, uh, do whatever it takes to be close to me. But you'll never be anything like me. No. This is what Jesus says. Greater things than these will you do. What, everything that I am doing, you are empowered. I'm going to equip you. I'm going to empower you. I want for you to go beyond me. This is just awesome. This is true empowerment. This is me showing you everything that I know so that if anything happens to me or, or you know, uh, uh, that there are a people that can go beyond me where we share our values and we share similar DNA and yet I celebrate the fact that you're radically different than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we see Jesus, he recruits a diversity of homeboys, okay? And they are supernatural, and they are radical, and they are doing the stuff, okay? Um, and this, this great gospel of Jesus Christ begins to spread to regions and to nations, okay? Now, uh, somewhere around 300, 350 AD. Now, remember, now, Christianity is absolutely illegal. It'll get you killed, okay? And these guys are getting martyred. People are getting killed everywhere. Nero, the person 
persecution of the church. Okay, you get to about 350 AD, where all of a sudden the emperor Constantine does what nobody saw coming. He, he claims to have seen a vision of a cross. He converts to Christianity and what had been, okay, underground, an underground movement of radicals, all of a sudden becomes the government religion. This thing gets sanctioned. What was organic, what was people meeting in homes and just, you know, let's go, ah, it's the cops, and they jump out the windows and take off running, and, you know, like, this is like the, the first century version, bad boys, bad boys, what you get, Romans, you know, you know, here are the Romans, and, and, and the, the, the disciples are just booking it through the woods, and the Romans got their dogs going out to the disciples. This is the first century, this is the first century church, and you get to 2021, and people are like, I don't know if I should go to, to a real church where there's real people sitting in real chairs. Why? I don't feel like it's safe. What? <laughs> Join the church of Jesus Christ, and we guarantee you will be safe. Yeah, wrong religion. Read your Bible, okay? Yeah, this thing will get you killed real quick. Okay, but all of a sudden, what was illegal, okay, and what was underground becomes the state religion. This becomes the national religion. But, but, but it was still supernatural. This is the weirdest part. Now, all of a sudden, you have a compromised church that takes elements of Christianity and elements of paganism. They begin to merge it together, okay? And now you have a church that is compromised, and yet you still have the supernatural. Resurrections from the dead. You still have um, uh, 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 um, exorcisms. You still have people... Uh, Full on levitating. You have people taking authority over creation. You have a very mystical and yet compromised church. Which brings us to a monk, okay? A beer making monk named Martin Luther. He gets ticked off. He says, this is wrong. You guys are charging for the forgiveness of sins. This is what, this is what you used to do. You used to be able to roll up to the church, up to the drive-thru, and I'll go to number four. Okay, okay, awesome. I know what number four is. That's repentance for cheating on your wife, cheating on your tax. That's the cheating deal. All right, all right, that'll be $2,000. Come right up to the first window. Go up to the first window. Give me your two grand. Your sins are forgiven. All right, you're good. Martin Luther says, this is not the way it ought to be. And we see the Great Reformation take place. Now, through the Great Reformation, and thank you, Jesus, for the Great Reformation, we see a church split take place. And what we have at the church split is the Protestants and the Catholics. Here's what happened, though. Because the Catholics were using the supernatural as proof that their doctrine was correct, okay, the Protestant reformers said, you can keep your supernatural and we will take our doctrine. We'll take our doctrine, you take the supernatural, okay? And what we see there is a great divorce from the supernatural, from the Protestant church. And it's not really until the late 1800s that we begin to see a rest, early 1900s, it wasn't until the 1900s that we got to see a restoration of the gift of tongues restored back to the church. Can you believe that? How recent this thing is. And all of a sudden we begin to see a new generation of supernaturalists that begin to emerge in the early 1900s. Which brings us up to our present day and age. There are generals who are alive, who walk the earth. Okay, some of which, some of which will be at our conference coming up. Uh, others of which are sending in uh, videos. We have Bobby Connor, Patricia King sending in prophetic words for declaration conference. Okay, generals that are alive, people that have seen, people like uh, like Papa Mahesh Shavda. Okay, who who hosted a a, a revival meeting uh, somewhere in Africa when all of a sudden a naked man fell through the ceiling, hit the ground. What had happened? He was a witch doctor, a shapeshifter, was flying over the meeting. When he flew over the church, he lost all of his power, materialized into a human being, fell through the roof of the church, and hit the ground. Mahesh Shabda is alive today. And this is, th th to talk about these radical, he's one of the original glory gangsters. That's, what, that's the title that I've given to him. And this is what we're going to do, you guys. We are on a journey where we are studying 
the men and women who God has used to bring heaven to earth. And we are studying the 12 apostles. And then we're going to study 12 of the desert fathers slash mystic saints within the Catholic Church. Crazy supernaturals, crazy stories. And then we're going to fast forward and look at 12 of God's generals, looking at William Branham, John Alexander Dowie, Smith Wigglesworth, Mariah Woodworth Eder, who would trance out in her meetings, Catherine Coleman. We are going to fast forward then and look at 12 modern day living supernaturalists. We're going to celebrate them, honor them, and maybe even get a couple here in person. This is the journey, this is the journey that we are on to honor our supernatural history as Christians and to say that if you remove the supernatural from Christianity, you no longer have Christianity. You have moralistic deism. We believe that the supernatural does not exist just for a few good men to be able to build a ministry off of their supernatural gifting. No, the supernatural exists for the righteous to execute justice on the earth, to reweave shalom so that the areas of society that have been fractured by the sin and the curse can be reversed through sons and daughters of God who are not just professing the gospel, but they are in possession of the power of Christ Jesus. Jesus is raising up a new breed of supernaturalists, uh, people that you and I know and love. Richard Gordon, he was just here last weekend. Did you guys enjoy Richard Gordon, the team, the team from Bethel? Richard Gordon is one, he is a modern day mystical general. A lot of people don't even realize um, the things that God has done with that guy. He is fed scrolls in the spirit from an angel. I'm not making this up where he eats the scroll and supernatural technology unfolds into his mind. Okay, now, he is an engineer. He is a, uh, a, a software engineer. Uh, uh, he's got a, a doctorate in, uh, in encryption, in, in telecommunications, in cr- encryption technology. So here's what the Lord does. He downloads technology into his soul. And because he has the education, his education can interpret the data that the Lord is showing to him. He's been contracted by Google. has been featured in Bloomberg Magazine. He's met with the heads of state. And his telecommunications thesis, that Jesus gave to him has been published in several different languages. Not only that, but this thing is transferable. The Lord has used Richard to, uh, uh, to launch the school of technology at Bethel. And they're teaching people some things in the natural. But they're also laying hands on young people. And guess what? Many of their young people are stepping into that same realm where God is releasing to them supernatural and heavenly technology. Man, <laughs> and what could God do with you? You know, how many know that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results? What is the perfect pattern interrupt to that kind of insanity? An encounter with Jesus. An encounter with oh, There was a, a guy that was here last week, and he got prayed for, and the power of God hit him, and he just and he got wrecked. And he said to me today, today I'm a different, I'm a different person. Something's been growing in me in the last seven days. For you, this is kind of fun. So um, my Verizon sales guy uh, showed up at our second service today. So if you don't know, I have, uh, I've joined the Verizon family, okay? And this guy was helping me switch over my lines. He was getting me some new phones. Then all of a sudden he says to me, uh, he says, hey, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. And he lights up. And he goes, awesome. I said, do you go to church? He goes, well, I just recently thought that I should find a church. And it turns out he's Catholic. I said, awesome. He could have been a Mormon. I would have said, awesome. I said, what are you looking for? He says, I'm looking for community. I said, hey, we got three services, but I want you to come to our second service. I'll connect you with some people. So he shows up today in the second service. I, I, I see him giving, which is awesome. 
Because I know people have been saved for a long time and don't give. So anyways, here's, here's this new guy. He's not really sure, but hey, people are giving you. Is that what I'm going to do? I, I said, I recognize that guy. It kind of looks like Tom Cornell from the back. I said, what is, Tom, is that Tom? And I, I realized, hey, that's, that's my Verizon guy. I run to the back of the church, and I greet him and welcome him. It, it, uh, awesome guy. I, I, I embarrassed him publicly. At the end of the service, hey, if you want to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you know, just go and lift up your hand. He lifts up his hand. We get to pray for him. He got to connect with our, our young adults, the connect group. Yeah. I joined the Verizon family, and then he joined my family. Here's the other thing. That didn't require no evangelism course either. I did nothing to catch that fishy. That thing just jumped right in my boat. Everyone say Peter. Yeah, Peter. We studied Peter in our first week. This guy would become known as the leader of the disciples, but he wasn't the leader originally. Peter was, I relate with Peter. Peter, in the beginning, was very, very passionate, but not very competent. Do you remember those days? Those days when you were very, very passionate for Jesus, but you didn't really know a lot. You were passionate, but when you would speak up, it wasn't really, here's the thing, when you're passionate, you never know that what you're saying is not necessarily all that good. Because when you're a passionate person, you always think that what you have to say is like the best thing ever. It's not until over time, you go back and you replay the things that you did say, and you're deleting them off of YouTube, amen? <laughs> okay, that's kind of that's like Peter, super passionate, okay? He becomes the leader of the twelve. Um, uh, uh, gets saved through a miraculous supernatural fishing trip. He was a fisherman. Jesus had a little nickname for him. Nobody else got to call him this, by the way. The only person that, that called him his nickname was Jesus. So everybody else would call him Peter, but Jesus would call him Cephas or Rock. So, hey, Peter, get over here. But whenever Jesus talked to him, he would say, Rock. Yeah, Jesus? You my boy, Rock. Okay, Jesus. Weird, but cool. Jesus, I believe in you, so you can call me whatever you want, okay? Peter was with Jesus through some amazing moments, part of the inner three. He was with Jesus for the transfiguration, um, uh, uh, which was an awesome moment. We had some fun with that. When we are studying the life of Peter, we see that Jesus does something radical in him. What does Jesus do? He transforms him. There was a period of time where Peter was actually ashamed of Jesus, where Peter actually denied Jesus three times. But after being filled with the Holy Spirit, we see in Acts chapter 2 that he who was once embarrassed of his relationship with Jesus is the one that confronts the mockers and the critics. How many of you have ever been told, don't respond to the critics? If Peter hadn't have responded to the critics, we wouldn't have seen that revival that went from 120 people to thousands of people. Why? The early church was born from critics and mockers. You see, Peter, he understood critics. He understood that kind of passion. And as he was being mocked, he stood up and said, these are not drunk as you suppose. What did he do? He confronted them, and the church went from 120 to 3,000 people in a day. We also see in Acts chapter 3 that Peter heals the crippled beggar. We also see um, that, uh, that Peter gets thrown in jail and an angel shows up and breaks him out. In Acts chapter 5, everywhere, everywhere that Peter went, Peter went, Peter went. Acts chapter 5, 14 says, and they were all healed. Even people he didn't even pray for. Even people that just his shadow went over top of them and they would get healed. What is that? That's a standard. That's a goal. That's a New Year's resolution for 2024. <laughs> he gets to see the paralytic healed. He uh, gets to see Dork. Uh, 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 he gets to see a resurrection um, of the dead. Uh, he um, uh, is somewhat of a culprit. He's a part of a the justice of God as released upon Ananias and Sapphira when they uh, lie to the Holy Spirit um, and the Lord strikes them dead. Um, he gets arrested again, thrown in prison again. And what happens? An angel shows up again and breaks 
Peter out of prison a second time. Has an incredible vision, right? Where, um, where the, uh, the smorgasbord of halibut and crab comes down um, from heaven. And God says, kill and eat, okay? Setting him up for a revival of the Gentiles, okay? Um, we see Peter preaching all throughout the New Testament. And at the end of Peter's life, there is the record of his martyrdom. And when he was martyred, it, 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 is, it is claimed that he declared, I am not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as my my Lord, and it is written from several first uh, century historians that they crucified him upside down on a cross. And then we looked at um, Andrew and James. Let's look at Simon's. P- uh, uh, let's look at uh, Peter's brother. Andrew. In each of the Gospels, we see uh, Peter's brother, Andrew. He doesn't get his own book. And we don't necessarily know a lot about him. And so we see these different occurrences of him throughout the Bible. But one thing that we know is that his name, Andrew, means courageous and manly, okay? We see that, um, uh, uh, that he is also a fisherman alongside of his brother. It is believed that he was a disciple of John uh, the Baptist. Um, he is referred to as one of the first called, and the legacy of the apostle Andrew is that he was known as an evangelist or a missionary. These guys all get the title apostle because they all were on television and had really nice suits, No, they were called apostles because they were sent ones. Apostle means sent one. So these were cats that knew Jesus, that loved Jesus, that were commissioned by Jesus. And after Jesus came and filled them, what did he do? He sent them. And they went on mission. The fascinating thing um, about Andrew is that he has a legacy in history. And there are various writings and accounts of Andrew journeying up from Jerusalem and going up all the way and, and, uh, and doing a major missions campaign all the way around the Black Sea, this would, in, this would include um, parts of Turkey going up into uh, Georgia, going up into uh, uh, all these places that are known today as you know, Moldova and Romania and Bulgaria. There is evidence that Andrew was there and led people to Jesus. Andrew was also martyred, and, um, and when, they, when they went to crucify him, he also requested to not be crucified on a cross. But what they did is they tethered him to to an X, and for three days, okay, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he pled with people for their salvation until after three days, he finally died. Then we see, um, uh, we also studied um, James, James the Great. And James was uh, 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 the son of, of Zebedee, the brother of the apostle that we're going to be reading about tonight. Um, in our study of, of James, we see that he and his brother were known for their temper. We'll see that from his older brother, John, and the nickname that they received. They were a part of Jesus' inner circle. So again, when Jesus began his ministry, he began by including people. In fact, just before the Holy Spirit comes, we know that there is a solid gathering of trusted people that included 120. But Jesus also had a smaller group of people that he actually empowered and sent off to go do miracles. And that was a group of 72. Okay? But Jesus also had a smaller group of friends. What is this? This is something that we should all practice within our own lives. This is what's called a target with various circles that get smaller and smaller and smaller. There should be a place in your life for everyone. Okay? There should be a place in your life for everyone, but that doesn't mean you give your heart to everyone. Jesus would make himself available to the masses, to some pretty screwed up people, 
and they would find redemption and, and an offer of restoration. But th- so there was the masses, there was the 120, okay? There was the 72, and then there was the 12 that we are studying. But then there was the three. Peter, James, and John, and sometimes Peter's brother. Yes, he had a name, but not in the Bible. He was always Peter's brother. Peter, James, and John, and Peter's brother got to come along as well. So James is a part of this, part of this, this team. James was also the first martyr. And we see this in Acts chapter 12. He was put to death by being stabbed with, with a sword. What's interesting about the apostle that we're going to study tonight is that he's the only apostle that was not martyred. Tonight, you guys, we're going to study John the Beloved. The apostle John is mentioned in every gospel except the one that he authored. We see in all the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that he is always referred to as John. Matthew chapter 4, verses 21 and 22, it says, Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. So James and John are brothers. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets, and Jesus called out to them, And immediately they left their boat, and uh, they left their father, and they followed him. We also see in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 and 9, Paul is writing to the Galatians. And what's he doing? He's correcting them. Why? Because the Galatians were, were starting to believe all kinds of heresy. Sometimes good Christians believe bad doctrines. Amen? Sometimes good Christians believe bad doctrines. And this was happening um, within Galatia. And Paul writes to, uh, to confront their, their bad doctrine. Um, there was all this teaching, and there was a, a specific false teacher that was going around, and he had a huge YouTube following. And he was teaching everyone that they still needed to follow the Mosaic Law. There was this teaching that what Jesus did was not enough. That you need Jesus Plus, plus law. Thank you. Jesus plus law. And what does Paul do? He writes to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. And this is what he says. On the contrary, I, uh, 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 they recognize, I have been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to who? To the uncircumcised. Just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God who was at work in Peter, an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, esteemed as pillars in the early church, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. When they recognized the grace given to me, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles Um, and they to the circumcised. Here Paul is referring to this inner three, Peter, James, and John, as pillars in the early church. We see in Mark chapter 3, the description of the first 12 apostles. I'll read it to you. Mark chapter 3, 16. And these were the 12 appointed apostles. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the nickname, the sons of thunder. Okay? Here's my question. What do you have to do to get the nickname, the sons of thunder? These guys were super, super passionate. We see in Luke um, 9, verse 54, um, that James and, and, and John, uh, uh, at one point, they lose their tempers. Um, and uh, uh, we see a group of Samaritans that didn't want to welcome Jesus into their village. And so James and John, they go to Jesus and they say, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and to destroy them? <laughs> 
You know what I love about that? You know what I love about that? They didn't say, hey, Jesus, isn't this the time that you call down fire and destroy those dirty, evil, annoying Samaritans? They didn't say it. That's what I love about the sons of thunder. Jesus, don't you agree that this is time that we call down some fire and destroy all those pathetic Samaritans? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus is like, no, no, wrong, Ah, wrong answer. No. What's wrong with you guys? We're just triggered, ah, right? This is, this is, this is the look of, of, of you, know, you know, we always think of John the Beloved. Oh, he was so peaceful and passive. And just, uh, I just want to lay my head upon your chest. You know, Jesus, Jesus. You know, I, I got a good friend, and he kind of, you know, he kind of makes fun of the Apostle John a little bit. He's always like, man, John is kind of like the most annoying apostle. He's always like, oh, I'm the beloved. Jesus, I'm your favorite. I'm the disciple. You know, but no, he was one of the sons of thunder. This guy was crazy. And what we actually get to see is, as we see in all the apostles, is the transformation that occurs through relationship. Jesus recruited ordinary dudes that were ordinary and un, unschooled. They were unpolished. What did Jesus do? He said, hey, come. Forsake everything. Come and follow me. And guess what? I'm going to include you. Jesus honored those guys by doing what? By including them. Sometimes in the church, we don't want to include people until they look just like us. These guys looked nothing like Jesus, and he included them. They were always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. They were always making fools out of themselves all the way up until the point that Jesus empowered them. You would think at a certain point in time, Jesus would say, Wow, you guys finally really impressed me. You guys have graduated discipleship school. I believe you have what it takes. But no, it's almost like Jesus is like, Man, you guys are still all screwed up, but I got to go. So the church is yours. Have fun. We never get to see the great graduation into maturity, but these guys were transformed by their relationship with Jesus. And we get to see this incredible transformation of of John. John, the one with the crazy temper. It was like, it was like, you know, angry and angrier, right? Not dumb and dumber, but angry and angrier. Look at these guys. You know, <laughs> you know. You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't want to cheat them at the poker table, okay? They would just, they would just not be, they would not be having it, okay? We see here that they are ones that Jesus trusted, okay? We see these very intimate moments with John where he includes, where Jesus includes his inner three. This is when uh, Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. He had everybody, everybody leave the room. Everybody leave, but not my three. I want to include my three. This is a discipleship opportunity. Are you going to do something amazing this year? Wave at me. Who are you going to include? Who are you going to include? Yeah, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the mountaintop. We studied this. This is absolutely amazing. This is the transfiguration. And Jesus is like, hey, I want to show you what it's like to be welcomed into my prayer closet. And guess who shows up? Moses and Elijah. People say, I don't, I don't like it. I was in a church meeting and somebody said that somebody showed up in the spirit. They said that, you know, I, I was just on a podcast. Um, I was a guest on Liz Wright's podcast this last week. And it'll be coming out in a, in, in a few weeks. And she said to me, I, I had the most incredible encounter with Paul recently. Uh, the Apostle Paul? Yep. And she told me another encounter that she just had with Jesus recently. Jesus came and put his forehead on her forehead. They went head to head. Well, I, you say, okay, Jesus, that, that's fine, but I'm not into Paul. I'm not into, the Bible restricts talking to the dead. The problem is, these guys ain't dead. Jesus says, hey, I want to invite you into, do you want to know what it's like? Jesus is always sneaking away. If you follow the journey of Jesus, Jesus is always disappearing. Like, where's Jesus? We lost Jesus again. No. He said, hey, do you want to know what it's like when I pray? Sure. Hey, come with me. Jesus takes him up to a mountain, and there Moses and Elijah show up, and guess who is there? I love this painting. You'll see them at the very bottom. There's Jesus, there's Moses, there's Elijah, and there they are at the very bottom. Just, ah. 
a little awkward. Jesus included the three. On the night of Jesus' betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. What does he do? He takes them with him to pray, and he asks them to keep watch. You going to do some amazing things this year? You going to do some really cool stuff? Maybe you might even fail at some stuff this year. Maybe you're going to try, try, try. Who are you going to include? Jesus had his 120. Jesus had his, his 72. Jesus had his 12. Jesus had his three. Hey, I'm about to do something really intimate, really special. I want to include you. How many of you know that when, when you're a part of a, a group of three, you get to see things that other people don't get to see? How many of you know that when you're a part of a group of three, what's very important is loyalty? You're going to see things, you're going to hear things, and guess what's going to be established? Guess what has to be established? A platform of trust. Why? Because within that, tr- that, that platform of trust is going to come forth an intimacy that is forged through conflict. And here we have these apostles, these sent ones, these disciples that followed Jesus, that were rebuked by Jesus, but they did not interpret the rebuke as rejection. Peter, even at one point, was called, referred to as Satan. And Pe- what does Peter do? Okay, cool. He slicks with him. He keeps following him. He pursues after him until finally that moment when Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. Why? I trust you. We've been in it together. We got stories that we're not allowed to talk about. There's things that we've experienced that are never going to be written about. That are never going to be published. How many know that Peter, James, and John had moments with Jesus that we may never ever get to find out about this was an intimacy that was forged through this dynamic john he is never referred to in the gospel that he wrote as john so he never refers to himself um, by his name rather he refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Which I think is awesome. This is, what the, this is what the Apostle John says. The Apostle John says, Sure, Jesus recruited Peter. They had a relationship. You can call them friends. Sure, James. James and Jesus, sure. They, they were cool. Jesus, Jesus imparted. And, yeah, sure, ab- absolutely. But who, who am I? I'm the one that Jesus loved. Isn't that epic? I think that is, I think that is so awesome. We see the, this title here, John 13, 23, John 19, 26, John 20, verse 2, John 21, uh, verse, verse, uh, verse 7. In John 13, 23 and 24, it says, And one of them, referring to himself, the disciple whom Jesus loved, <laughs> was reclining next to Jesus, okay? And Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and asked him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? We see at once Jesus is betrayed and arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and only two disciples follow Jesus from his trial from a distance. We see Peter, the beloved disciple, And while the beloved disciple pulls some strings to bring Peter closer to Jesus, Peter denies any sort of association with the Lord. But we do see one of the most well-known examples. The one whom Jesus loved comes in John chapter 20 after Jesus dies on the cross when Mary Magdalene discovers the empty tomb. This is John 20, verses 2 to 9. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. I just love it, okay? And says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, 
But the other disciple outran Peter. So the one whom Jesus loved was not only the most loved by Jesus, but he was also way faster of a runner than Peter. I just love he points it out. Okay, he reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there. Isn't this awesome? John the Beloved reaches the tomb first. He looks in and Jesus isn't there. Then Simon Peter finally got to the tomb a long time later. Okay, and along behind him went straight to the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, who had reached the tomb first. Isn't this awesome? Finally, the other disciple, me, who's also the fastest runner. <laughs> it's just these guys. They're just normal guys. These are just normal guys. And even in their writings, they, there's just these little things that they put in their writings that, where you can just, you can just see their, their personality coming through, coming through their, their writings. It's like, here's John the Beloved. Man, he's so humble, and yet he was also the most loved. <laughs> it's also believed that John was also a, a disciple of John the Baptist. We see this also in uh, John chapter 1, verses 35 and 42, uh, their encounter with uh, John, with John the Baptist. So John the Beloved, he wrote the book of John. He also wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, according to most scholars. Most scholars agree. And we also see in Revelation uh, chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, it starts off, I, John, so I, the author of this book, known as John. I know that John wrote Revelation because he said he did. Okay. And companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write a scroll, and what you see, send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, what's fascinating about the life of John is that we do have the record and pretty close dates from when all these other apostles uh, were martyred. When it comes to the life of John, uh, uh, he was not martyred, which is, which is interesting. We do see a very fascinating scripture verse in John 20, 21, verses 20 22. Check this out. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> I just love it was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper, who had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, referring to John the Beloved, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Now, if you keep reading, there is indication, you know, because there were rumors that John was never going to die, okay? So, did John die? Did John not die? Is John cruising the streets of Ireland right now? Is he trading cryptocurrency? Did he invent Bitcoin? All things are possible. Not all things are, are probable. Nobody really knows who invented Bitcoin, could be John the Beloved. Just saying. Fascinating thing, though. The only, guys, check it out. The only, um, the only apostle that wasn't martyred was the one that Jesus looked over and said, if I want him to remain alive, who are you to do anything about it? Who are you to say anything about it? First century um, historian uh, Tertullian, a Christian writer from the late century, 
um, as well as others, write that the Romans banished John. They brought him to a Colosseum where they dunked him in a vat of boiling oil. By the way, that should have killed him. If I want him to remain alive, who are you to say anything about it? When they took him out of the boiling oil, he emerged unharmed. And the entire Colosseum was converted to Christianity. Eventually, he would make it back to Ephesus, where John the Beloved, um, it's believed, maybe died an old man. We don't have the record. How did he die? Where did he die? We don't know. But there is record of John the Beloved living a full, long life, telling of the testimony of Jesus, telling of what it was like to lay. That's so cool. It is so cool, and it is also so unfair. All these other guys were getting, you know, beheaded, decapitated, stretched out, burned at the stake, you know, just horrible deaths. And, there, and there's John, and he's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Banish me to an island? Put me on an island to die? I'm just going to trance out and go into the third heaven and write a book. They put him there to die. What did he do? He wrote a bestseller. <laughs> and then they try to boil him. He gets out untouched, preaches the gospel. It's, it's like the biggest Billy Graham crusade everywhere. Everybody, everybody gets saved. He lives a long life. And he's a pillar in the church. When various, and Josh, if you want, if you want to come, when various her- heresies would begin to emerge within the church. Guess, guess, guess whose gospel they would use to refute the various... The Gnosticism was a big one, right? Gnosticism said, Jesus came, but he wasn't actually a physical person. Jesus came, but he was just a spirit. Jesus didn't actually die, die physically on a cross. Jesus came, but he was like, he was like a ghost. He was like a spirit. And, and, and even a lot of historians believe that even the gospel of John, that John wrote it to refute heresies that were beginning to emerge within the church. And John, in his book, goes through seven moments that he observed with his own eyes that testify of the physical and supernatural nature of Jesus the Christ. That his book would become a testimony, a legal testimony established in the church. John says, I was there at the wedding when, they, when, when the wedding planner made a boo-boo. Okay, either the wedding planner made a boo-boo or just honestly they were drinking way too much wine. What a lot of people think, you know, they, they ran out of wine. Well, good. I'm glad they ran out. That they are carried away, shut the party down. My God, go home and go to bed. The party's over. Except for there was a woman there that didn't think the party should be over yet. The mother of Jesus. She said, Jesus, do something. And Jesus is like, woman, my time hasn't come tough Jesus and then Mary goes I said Jesus do something he goes okay mom (laughs) see see all those jars get those jars over here fill them full of water John says I was there for the very first miracle of Jesus when he turned the water into wine and as people began to taste it they This is cool. I was just in Texas, and they did a prophetic round table at a winery. I was sitting there next to, you know, Paul Wilbur and a bunch of other people, Troy Brewer, just a bunch of really cool people. But before it was time to go to the round table, 
I went to the back of the room where they had the, the gal that is in charge of all the wines. And because we we're in the Bible Belt, nobody was sipping nothing. Because to be a Christian, you have to vote Republican, don't watch radar movies, and don't sip wine. So nobody was even talking to her. She's back there. She's got all these bottles. They're all eating really good food, but drinking some water. Come on. So I went around praying for the water. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, uh, <laughs> I went up to her. And you know what? We, we, we had a great conversation. And you and I told her, I said, hey, do you want to know what the first miracle of Jesus was? She didn't know. She said, what? She said, the very first miracle of Jesus was he turned the water into wine. I said, that was a big deal. Wine in the Bible is symbolic for joy and for covenant. I said, and here's the other thing. At a wedding, they would always serve the best wine first. And at the end, they'd bring out the box wine, the Carlos Rossi. Wow, a gallon for three bucks. After Jesus turns the water into wine, people start to trip out and they say, what kind of host? What kind of host would be so generous to wait to the very, very end to serve their best? You see, that wasn't just a wine miracle. That was a glimpse into the character and nature of Jesus, into the character and nature of the kingdom. That if you're young, those aren't the best days. No, no, no. God saves the best wine for last. Your best days are ahead of you, not behind you. This is what John says. This is what John says. I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. This is what John said. I tasted of that wine. <laughs> John says, I was there. When the royal official's son was healed, I was there. When the paralytic was healed at the pool, I was there. When we had to figure out how are we going to feed 5,000 people with a couple fish sticks and a couple bread sticks, Jesus said, Bring, 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 bring me what, whatever they got. And they brought him a couple fish sticks and some bread sticks. And what did Jesus do? He gave thanks, and he said, now feed everyone. John says, I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. I ate that fish. I ate the bread. I was there. John says, I was there. We were on the boat. We looked out, and there was a man. And what was he doing? He was doing what no man should be able to do. He was walking on the the water with his eyes on us. We, I was there. I saw him walk on the water. He says, I was there. When the man who was born blind, I was there when Jesus spit into the mud and put the mud on his eyes. I was there when his eyeballs were formed. I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And John says, it's the seventh miracle. You see, these seven miracles, these seven, the seven signs of John the Beloved. And the seventh was when Jesus went to visit his friend, Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. Cord, spirit, we've gotten into that before. And now it was too late. Jesus arrived too late according to everybody's schedule. But guess what? According to Father's schedule, he was right on time. How many of you, how many of you that's, that's been your, your story this year? I had, ah, 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 God, God, you failed me. God, you failed me. I needed you. I trusted you. I thought I heard from you. God, you feel me. Now you're, now you're too late. John says, I was there when Jesus approached the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead dude, 
who was like rotting and decaying at this point stood up regenerated restored alive john says no 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 i saw it i i saw it i saw it with my own with my own eyes i the disciple whom jesus loved testify these things to you they are true i was there and the final chapter book in, in our Bible we see the revelation a lot of people think the book of revelation is all about dragons and whores no that's game game of thrones the book of revelation is a story of the revelation of Jesus the Christ written by the disciple whom Jesus loved and it's a book of worship and it's a book of covenant promise it's a book of of loving correction and rebuke to the churches it's a book of awakening saying prepare yourself and get yourself ready for behold he comes he will come and we see this great promise of his return and we see this great promise of restoration and we see this great promise and we see come up to the very climax where it doesn't end but it says to be continued to be continued and now here we are an apostolic generation of sent ones filled with the spirit of Christ Jesus called for such a time as this to be possessed by his spirit to be captured by his glory to respond to injustice with this proclamation that every impossibility has to bow before the authority of Christ Jesus that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world and we honor Peter we honor James and we honor Peter's brother forget his name oh yeah Andrew and we honor John the beloved if God could use these guys these hot-headed passionate incompetent people and transform them through relationship then by golly I think he could use Darren I by golly I think he could even use you Dave like that that God has called us and equipped us and the only thing keeping us from the radical next level wah 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 is that thing between our ears called our brain that wants to limit us with speed limits that God never put on the church He's called you. He's ordained you. That in history past, before you ever knew him, he knew you. He said, before you knew me, I knew you. You weren't your idea. You weren't your mommy's idea. You weren't your daddy's idea. You were his idea. So don't shame yourself. And don't disqualify yourself. And don't even compare yourself. The world doesn't need another Bobby Connor. The world doesn't need another Bill Johnson. The world needs you. The world needs you, Roman. The world needs you. Come on, Lana. The world needs you. You say, I've been through too much stuff. I've failed in so many ways. I've, I've, for certainly, I'm arriving too late in the story for God to use me. The problem with that is the Bible. It's the record and the testimony of our faithful God who chooses unfaithful people, who redeems them, who forgives them, and then establishes them. If you want to be used by God in your generation, all you have to say is yes to a relationship with Him. That we don't we don't serve God just for His power. We don't serve God just for the supernatural. We serve Him because He loves us. We serve Him because we love Him. That it's an honor to know Him. It's an honor to love Him. And I am telling you that if you will begin to foster a real, real relationship between you and Him, not a religion, but a relationship where you could honestly say, that's all good, but I know Him. That's all good. Your opinion of me is all good. The problem is this. I know God. And He knows me. You can judge me. You can criticize me. You can threaten lawsuits. That happened a couple times this last week over email. Praise the Lord. Here's the problem. I know God. 
And if I'm not living in sin, I don't have to live in fear. Solomon would say that those who are compromised run when no one's even chasing them. But the righteous are as bold and freaky as lions. As lions. I am telling you, he's preparing us. He's preparing us for what? I'm telling you, he's preparing us in the same way that he prepared the cosmos on the first six days of creation. For six days, he created. Day one, day two, time, space, vegetation, humans. What was he doing? He was preparing a tabernacle, a place for the seventh day. On the seventh day, he would sit down and settle in. I believe that what God is doing right now is he is doing a creative work in the house of God. He is preparing his church. He is preparing his sanctuary. He is preparing his people because our God is about to come down. He's about to sit on you. I'm telling you, God is about to sit on Seattle Revival Center. I'm telling you, God is about to sit on Seattle. And He's not just going to sit on. He's going to sit in. You won't be able to level up or level down. You will not be able to control His power. You will not be able to control His glory that what will connect us and anchor us with longevity and a security to finish well cannot be a lust for the supernatural but has to be an honor for what the Apostle John discovered that I just want to lay my head upon your breast I just want to be where you are I don't want your stuff Jesus I just want you and if, if we will say I can't control the power dynamic, but I can control my hunger and my thirst for a relationship with His presence and with who He is. I'm not going to blame the past. I'm not going to blame people for whatever level or this or that. I can control my hunger. My This is what David said, that even after, as the deer lusts and pant for the water, so my soul lusts and thirsts after the presence of you, Jesus. And this is what will anchor us. And this is what will secure us with longevity within the church. If we will say, hey, I, I may not have silver. I may not have gold. I may not have this. I may not have that. But if I can have my head on his breast, Jesus, you are enough. And whether I am one that loses my life while being strung up to an X where I, where I preach of the gospel of the Lord Jesus after Peter gets set free supernaturally from a prison twice, I will hang on the X. I will hang on the cross. I will hang on this place. Whether I'm in this place or I'm in the place of John the Beloved, that no matter what my future looks like, no matter what my present looks like, no matter what the outcome, no matter what obstacle I am going through, if I can have my head on his chest, then I am good to go. And Jesus, if you want me here for another 60 years, if you want me here for another 60 minutes, if my head can remain on your chest, you are enough. You are enough. You are enough. Jesus, you are enough. Jesus, you are enough. You are enough. Let us never lust after the power. Let us never lust after the trinkets. Let us never lust after the fame and the popularity of man. Let us never perform for the opinion and the approval of man, for it is fleeting. And you might get your 60 seconds of fame, but what is that worth if you have sold your soul? Don't perform for man. Don't fear man. Don't change your vocabulary for man. Fear God. Love God. Live for Him. Surrender to Him. And know this, that religion might think that you're a disgrace. And your old church might think, ah, whatever. And, and your old pastor might think whatever. And your parents might think whatever they think about you. But this is what I know to be true. You are loved by God and He is so proud of you. Not because of anything you have done and not because of anything you're going to do. He is so proud of you because you are a son and you are a daughter. And you've been blood bought. You've been brought into a covenant 
that He has instituted, that you did nothing to deserve your salvation, you did nothing to deserve your restoration, that all this has been made possible, yet by grace through faith alone in our Lord Jesus the Christ. Let's stand. Put your hand on your, on your heart, okay? I'm going to have you say something. I want you to repeat it after me. And I don't want you to talk back. I don't want, you to, I don't want to have an arguing match with you. You just can't have to take my word for this. But I want you to say it with conviction, okay? Are you ready? I am the child that Father loves. Now stop fighting you. Stop fighting. Now let's say it like we believe it. I am the child that Father loves. I don't need to fight His love. Just receive His love right now. John didn't let other people put this title on him. He gave himself this title. I am the disciple that Jesus loved. Tomorrow morning, I want you to wake up and look yourself in the mirror and say, I am the child the Father loves. God, we pray that Seattle Revival Center would not be known for crazy power miracles, even though we want to see them and we have seen them. We pray that we would not be known for awesome preaching, even though we get that three times every Sunday. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be known for our phenomenal worship and the crazy cool sounds that come out of this place, even though we have crazy cool worship. And Josh Park is legit. I pray that we wouldn't be known for our wicked, awesome chandeliers. I pray that we would be known for our love. Sincere, honest, affectionate love for you. And I pray that you would so wreck us with your love this year that we'd be able to love others honestly and truthfully and that we'd be able to love people that are really, really hard to love. God, give us your chest so we could lay our head down and hear your heartbeat.